revival over our city, over ourselves, and over our town, over our country. Lord, we thank you for that rattle. Your precious and holy name, amen. You may be seated. And now I'm going to have a service where I ask my 7 to 12 graders to take a stand, come and find me in the lobby so that we can have a stairs to our service. I will see you at the well. Hey, give it up for our next generation walking out that door right there. That's right. That's right, they don't have any dry bones in them at all. Because all they do is eat and sleep and sleep, right? That's what they do, amen? Man, that song is powerful, isn't it? Amen. Woo! I'm saying that I didn't know if I should get up and break dance or just break down and cry. I don't know what to do, man. It was so good. And you guys sounded amazing, so amazing, right? So here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do is I want you to turn to your neighbor, to the person next to you or maybe behind you. And I just want you to look him straight in the eye and say, man, Jesus looks really good on you. Make it happen. Make it happen right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus looks good on you, everybody. Amen. You're welcome. Hallelujah. Hey, let me, uh, let me uh, give you some uh, updates of what's going on. And what's happening. And so, again, I just want to reiterate, we make sure that when you come in here, you're into a, a safe environment. So we just wipe everything down for you. All the seats, the chairs, everything's wiped down. And then, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit comes in and just cleanses everything. So you're you're taking care of physically and spiritually, okay? Uh, and so I just want you to know that. So uh, let me remind you of how we're going to be doing offering while we're going through this time. Uh, so you'll see that there are many ways that you can give. Uh, while we were on our uh, hiatus, uh, while we were doing church online, this is the way we've been doing it. So you can you can give your tithing and your offering through our app or through uh, texting uh, to LW Cheyenne at seven seven nine seven seven. You can also go to our website. You can give online that way as well. If you brought your tithe with you today, there's a little black box as you're walking out the door. We ask you to stick it inside of there. And just you know, go that route. So we encourage you to do that. We we want to encourage you to keep giving. That's another way. It's another act of worship. Uh, and it's just another sign of obedience to our God. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Well, let me, let me uh, share with you a little bit about what's going on with Living Water. So yesterday, we had a group of people who, uh, from Living Water, uh, go and help build, uh, help build a house for Habitat for Humanity. I think we do have some pictures up here. I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I took some action pictures. 
uh, of it, and you know, I'm sure you will get it going there for you in a minute. So we had a, we had a, a team of people from uh, Living Water go out and uh, help build this gentleman's house. He's a single parent of, of three kids, uh, and his testimony is amazing. Oh, here you go. Here's some of them right here. So uh, they were busy putting up siding uh, on the house, and you guys can keep showing it as I'm talking. Uh, and so our team was uh, out there helping out, and, uh, and Steve did not cut anything off. Uh, as he was coming here, so everything's good. So good job, Steve. And so, uh, but anyhow, uh, so this gentleman, he was a single dad of three. Uh, his testimony was uh, impactful. So he didn't know the Lord for maybe uh, until about six years ago. And uh, somebody just uh, invited him to come to Element Church. He went to Element Church, and there he found God, and his life has been changed ever since, right? And so, and uh, we were just blessing on him, loving him. We got to pray over him, got to pray over his uh, business or his house, uh, and he's just excited. In fact, he told me that they're hoping to get in by Christmas, and he told his entire family, hey, Christmas is at my house this year. So he's super pumped about that, and so his name is Jamie. So uh, be in prayer for Jamie, and... Listen, uh, anytime, if you want to go out and help volunteer, uh, you can sign up anytime. You, uh, just go out and volunteer and help build up and uh, go that route. So we encourage you to do that, okay? So uh, Living Water is on the move in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Listen, women, ladies, here we go. It's so sweet coming up this Wednesday, August 5th, all right? So um, we have a women's Bible study uh, coming up. And uh, so they're doing it off uh, Jeremiah. This is going to be located in my house, starting, listen, refreshments are at 530. If you don't come at 530, the refreshments between my son and I, they're out. So you better come and you better give it. And then uh, uh, Bible study starts at 6. It's going to be amazing. Listen, some of you have already asked, some of you ladies have asked me, hey, is, this, is it too late to uh, be a part of it? No, it's never too late. Uh, you can always come in and be a part of it. We're also doing uh, uh, a Zoom. So uh, we're doing Zoom online. We have a lady from Missouri joining us. How cool is that? Isn't that cool? Uh, so um, we encourage you to come. Bring your friend. The question is, is, can I bring a lady friend? Yes, you can bring a lady friend. Listen, fellas, no, you can't come. Uh, come at 530. You can join the professionals with no. me. But then our tree says no. Uh, you know what? It's my house. So show up anyways, fellas. Uh, and we're going to just have some more. We're going to feast together. Girls only. All right? Girls only. All right, so then guys, guys night out. After we have refreshments, we'll go out and do something, okay? I'm just kidding. So, hey, listen, ladies, uh, if you want more information, come see my wife. She'd be happy to uh, get you connected and get you going, okay? God's good, amen? amen. Right, God's good, amen? amen? Amen. All right, open up your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. That's in the Old Testament if you want to know. So Ezekiel chapter 37, we are in the series of um, revival. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks is revival. Last week we talked about revival in me. What does revival in me look like? Right? We understand that the Latin word of revival means to live again. So uh, how many of you in these last two weeks went out and uh, I said, go be a blessing to somebody, even if it's yourself? How many of you blessed yourself? How many of you is like, you know what? I just need to bless myself. And and because sometimes we need to speak encouragement into ourselves, don't we? Especially in a time like this. Amen. Amen. All right, you're good. Listen, if you got it, if you got the scripture, say amen. amen. If you need a minute, say give me a minute. Give me a minute. Oh, okay. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. All right. So I'm sorry. So I give you a minute, but now you get 30 seconds. So Ezekiel 37. So let's stand as we read God's word. This is what we do here in Living Water. I'm going to be reading from the voice. And so if you uh, don't have the version of the voice, I have put it up here uh, on the screen for you all. So if you got Ezekiel 37, we're looking at verses 1 through 10, say amen. amen. So it says this, the eternal had a hold on me. Let me just pause right there. How many of you want the eternal to have a hold on you? Come on, right? How many of you, when I read this, man, I get excited when I read God's Word, because it's a living, breathing Word, amen? And so here we are, Ezekiel says, he says, the eternal had a hold on me, and I couldn't escape it. <laughs> How many of you want to be in the eternal grasp of God? Amen. All right, just a few of us. All right, that's cool. That's right, right? So it says this. I'm going to read it again, because it's exciting. The eternal had a hold on me, and I couldn't escape it. The divine wind of the eternal one picked me up and set me down in the middle of the valley. But this time it was full of bones. And God led me through the bones. 
There were piles of bones everywhere in the valley, dry bones left unburied. The Eternal One says to Ezekiel, Son of man, do you think these bones can live? And Ezekiel says, Eternal Lord, certainly you know the answer better than I do. And the Eternal One says, actually I do. Prophesy to these bones. Tell them to listen to what the Eternal Lord says to them. Dry bones, I will breathe breath into you, and you will come alive. I will attach muscles and tendons to you, cause flesh to grow over them, and cover you with skin. I will breathe breath into you, and you will come alive. After this happens, you will know that I am the Eternal. So I did what God had told me to do. I prophesied to the bones. As I was speaking, I heard a loud noise, a rattling sound. And all the bones began to come together and form a complete skeleton. I watched and saw muscles and tendons attached to the bones, flesh grow over them, and skin wrap itself around the reforming bodies. But there was still no breath in them. The Eternal One said, Prophesy to the breath. Speak, son of man, and tell them what the Eternal Lord has to say. O oh, sweet breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these who have been killed. Make these corpses come alive. So I did what God told me to do. I prophesied to the breath. As I was speaking, breath invaded the lifeless. The bodies came alive and stood on their feet. I realized then I was looking at a great army. <laughs> oh, man. So, Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. You are an amazing God, a powerful God. God, you bring things back to life. And Father, I believe that right now you are calling your church to come back to life. And so, Father, I pray, God, as we dive into your word today, God, that it would pierce our hearts. It's already pierced our hearts. But God, I pray, God, that it would pierce our hearts even more. And that you would just speak. So, Holy Spirit, come have your way here. Holy Spirit, come move here. Father, we pray you remove distractions, God. We pray, Lord, that you would just bring us into this place uh, of settledness with you. And Father, we pray, God, that your word will go forward in us. And God, that we would be different than when we walking out of here, than when we came in here. And so, Father, thank you, God, for who you are, for what you are. You're a mighty and powerful God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. Everybody have a seat. Uh, my sermon title today is called Return to Consciousness. It's a return to consciousness. The definition of consciousness means this, or it's defined as this. The state of being awake and aware of one's surroundings. Another word for consciousness is awareness, or alertness, or responsiveness. Consciousness. The state of being awake and aware of one's surroundings. I got a phone call um, when my son Avery was a senior in high school. And my son suffers with chronic migraines, just like his mother does. And so when he gets migraines, he tries to tough it out at school. Um, it's because I make him go to school. He's like, Dad, I got a migraine. Listen, man, go to school. If you can't make it, come back. Right? And he's probably there, you know, a half hour. Or maybe he makes it like two. So he calls me this one day. He says, Dad... I, I just can't do it. Can you come and get me? He's like, yeah, I'm on my way. I'm going to come and get you. So I come and pick him up. And he's sitting in the car. Right? He walks out of the school. He comes around my truck, gets in my truck, sits in my truck. And we have a small, brief conversation. As in, how are you doing? Are you feeling okay? No, I, I just don't feel good. So, okay. So it's quiet all the way home. So we get to the house. We pull into the, to the driveway. And I said, Avery, we're home. Let's go. And he's like, I thought he was sleeping. So I, I did this. Everywhere. I was like, wake up. He wouldn't move. So I grabbed him, and I was like, wake up! And he wouldn't wake up, right? So now I'm a little freaked out here. And so then I punched him in the face really hard. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't punch him in the face. That's abuse, guys. I headbutted him. So no, I'm just kidding. So I grabbed him, and I shook him really, and he went like this. He goes, <gasps> he just took a deep breath, and he started to panic because he's like, why am I in your truck, Dad? Why am I here? And I was like, son, you had a migraine. And he was a little freaked out. He was a little panicked. He didn't quite understand why he was in my, in my truck. See, what happened was, is that my son fell into a state of unconsciousness. He was, he was out completely. 
And I had to bring him back into a state of consciousness. And when he came back into the state of consciousness, he became of his awareness, his, uh, his surroundings, and he didn't understand why he was where he was. Consciousness. Return to consciousness. Revival is a return to consciousness after being in a state of unconsciousness. I believe that the church, and when I say the church, I mean the body. When I say the body, I mean you. When I mean you, I mean everybody who calls themselves a Christian, a follower, a believer in Jesus Christ. So when I say the church, I mean the entire body. Okay, you with me? So well, I believe that the, that the church is experiencing an awakening again and a returning to a state of consciousness right now. I believe that is happening right now. I believe that the body of Christ is starting to dig in. I'm seeing people, I'm seeing the body of Christ believers speaking against the schemes of the evil one that is happening right now. Listen, can I tell you something? The voice of Jesus Christ needs to be heard more now than ever. And you are the voice of Jesus. Amen. We need to be experiencing or coming into a state of consciousness right now. I don't know if you know this, but if you, if you look into Africa, if you look into Iran, there is revival breaking out where many people are coming into uh, a relationship with Jesus. People walking away from their Muslim faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the countries, in other countries like Africa and Iran, there is revival breaking out all over this place. They are waking up from a state of, uh, of unconsciousness. And many are coming to Jesus and being set free. How many of you believe that you are set free in the name of Jesus? Right? In the name of Jesus, we are set free. We live in freedom. We live in freedom. Last week, I shared with you many things, many revivals that broke out, uh, or not last week, two weeks ago. Uh, we were talking about how revival broke out in America all the way back in the 1700s. You remember that? It was long, and I read it to you, and some of you fell asleep, and then I had to wake you back up because I was just reading to you, okay? But I want to take you back further, okay? And I want to take you back further than just what happened in, uh, in America, but I want to take you all the way back to when the disciples received the Holy Spirit. You gotta understand, Jesus, Jesus has been resurrected. He has been hanging out with his disciples, and they watched him ascend into heaven. And there's and he says, Stay here because there is a gift. My father is going to bring you a gift. And they stayed there. And then the Holy Spirit came down and fell upon the disciples. And they started speaking in different languages, right? To all these other people. And as this was breaking out, right? So they're speaking and there's other people from other nations there. And they, they were like, wait a minute, how can I understand you? How can you be speaking in my language? I mean, you, you don't even speak my language, but they're speaking and, and people are hearing. In fact, the people that were there thought the disciples were drunk. And it was early in the morning. And Peter gets up and he's like, listen, man. No, 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 no. We're not drunk. Here's what's happening. And he starts preaching to Preaching like his life depended on it, right? Can I tell you something? Most preachers, they need to preach like their life depended on it. Can I tell you something? You need to live your life for Jesus like your life depended on it. You with me? Come on, church. Come on. So I want to share with you what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to put it on your screen. Check this out. So it says, Peter's words, so after he's speaking, it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. I want to stop right there. Listen, who's the promise for? For you? Who? Your children? And to those far away, right? All who have been called by the Lord our God. Let's go to the next week. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. <laughs> Let that sit in for a while. <laughs> then Peter started continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 at all. Come on. 3,000 people were baptized and have given their life to Christ. Walked away from a state of unconsciousness to a state of consciousness and were giving their lives to Christ. 3,000 at all, right? I'll tell you what. If you're at a church service and 3,000 people gave their life to Christ, would you be thinking that revival is breaking out? Listen, it didn't stop there, did it? Check this out. I want to show you some more. Listen, I want to take you on a journey. You want to go on a journey? Yes. Good. Check this out. So Acts 4, check this out. So, but many of the people who heard their messages or message believed it. So the number of men who believe now totaled about 5,000. So now 5,000 men have given their life to Christ. So here we are. This is where Peter and John are speaking. They're speaking in the in the middle of the town square. And there's like uh, some priests there. And the temple guard is there. And, uh, and some other folks there. And they don't like it. They don't like what uh, these two are saying. So they decided, let's get them out of here. And they threw them into jail, right? In Acts 4. They throw them into jail. But guess what? It's too late. 5,000 people have walked from a state of unconsciousness to a state of consciousness. It's starting to move. Look at, look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, but as the believers rapidly multiplied. Come on, this is getting exciting, right? Acts 2, 3,000. Acts 4, 5,000 more. And now in Acts 6, this is, I'm showing you math stuff here. Now we went from addition to multiplication, right? But as the believers rapidly multiplied, that's, a, that's amazing. Let's look at chapter 8. But now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were what? Baptized. Baptized. Eight chapters into Acts, and we're seeing the movement of Jesus shake up the nations. Did you know when you get into chapter 9, we're introduced to a man by the name of Saul, who eventually becomes Paul, a great persecutor of Christians. Jesus shows up on a rope, changes this man's life, and Paul goes on and sees revival break out through his ministry. Not only is God changing people's lives, but God changes one man's life to change millions of people's lives. And Paul became conscious, didn't he? I want to let's look at 2 Corinthians and check this out. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom. The Spirit of the Lord is right here, right now. He's right here, right now. And you are experiencing freedom. You are experiencing freedom. Because Jesus is here. And He is ready to wake you from your slumber and bring you back to consciousness. I have a question for you. Are you satisfied with where you are spiritually right now? Are you satisfied? Have you been wanting? Have you been needing? Have you been wanting to experience the freedom of Jesus? Come on. What's stopping you from having a relationship with Jesus? And I'm talking about a real relationship with Jesus. Not one where you say, I want a relationship with Jesus. I mean one, I need a relationship with Jesus. Come on. I'm sinking, Father. I'm drowning, Lord. Come and save me. I have this picture hanging up in my house. As soon as you walk in through the doors, it's, it's one of my favorite. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture that has pierced me. All right? and many of you saw it. If you have Facebook or if you have social media, it's, it's a picture of uh, Jesus. And he's standing on water. And he's got his hand into the water. And what it is, it's like a, it's a shot of you under the water and you see his smiling face and his feet standing on his water and his hand is pierced in the water waiting for you to grab it. That, that picture pierces me. It's powerful. It is powerful. I want a real relationship with Jesus. You want a real relationship with Jesus. Amen? 
listen, some of you are veteran Christians. <laughs> Can I call you that? Veteran Christians? Some of you are veteran Christians. I just turned 47. Okay? So I've been a Christian for 40 years of my life. All right? And I still am one and need a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to grow in Him every day. And so do you. All right? <clears throat> and so I believe it's time for the body of Christ to breathe in the breath of God and become the great army it is designed to be. Back when I was a youth pastor, I got to pastor, uh, I got to be the youth pastor in my home church. And it was, it was really neat. It was really cool. Uh, they showed me where our youth was meeting. It was a storage room. <laughs> I mean, boxes were on the floor to see. It was nuts. It was crazy. And I invested and spent some time just cleaning it out. Um, you know, sometimes churches can be hoarders. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, we really got to save this piece of paper that, you know, Mary Jo painted in 1847. And, you know, and so Mary Jo's in heaven. And so I think it's okay that we can get rid of it. And anyhow, so that, that's just, I'm just sharing some of the uh, the burdens of a youth pastor, okay? Uh, and so anyway, so uh, storage room, they, that, that's where it was. And so we built it into a place uh, where teens would want to hang out. And it took us about two to three years to get this thing up off the ground. You see, I inherited a ministry that didn't exist for like four or five years. And so we got to build it from ground zero. And, and so it took us a while. It took about two or three years to get it to where we wanted to see. We were averaging about 10 to 12 teens when we first started. In fact, there were nights where we only had one teen show up. We never had zero, but we always had one. And, if that, and for that one person, we took him to Dairy Queen, treated him to like blizzards, ice cream. Right? I mean, this kid had like 14 blizzards. We just didn't care. We're glad you showed up. But, you know, uh, and we were just investing in them and just loving on them. Uh, and, but we just kept praying. My team and I, we just kept praying. God, we believe that we are going to change our community through the through these teenagers. They're going to get it, and they're going to fall in love with you. And so we just kept praying. We just kept steady and kept going and going. Then one one Tuesday night, we met on Tuesday. One Tuesday night, we were we were averaging ten to twelve, and we shot up to twenty five. Just shot up to twenty five, right? And I was in awe. My leaders and I were like in awe. Like, this is amazing, right? 25 kids are showing up. And we're just loving on them and, 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 and just hanging out with them. And, and after every week, it started to grow. 25 to 27 to 30. And it just kept going. And here's the thing. They started lining up outside the church doors uh, right after school. School got done about 2, 33 o'clock. They would line up outside the church doors waiting to get in. And we didn't open doors until 5.30. And we wouldn't open the doors. I mean, so if it was raining, we're like, dude, sorry, grab an umbrella, man. Uh, you know, we wouldn't let them in. We were that evil to them. Uh, you know, it's just because we would let them in and then they would, it was just, I didn't have enough leaders. And so we said, 530, they didn't come in. Well, there was a kid that lived across the street from the church. And he saw all these teenagers lining up to get into to the church. And so he's like, I wonder what's going on. So he decided to join. Knew nobody. Didn't know anybody. Just came in and participated. And he joined in. And here's the deal. When he got in, he became a Christian, gave his life to Jesus, and became one of our youth leaders in, in, our, in our youth ministry. And he just kept growing. And some would show up at our praise team practices. We, they would show up and they would sit down and listen outside the window. And we would be practicing. And they would start singing out loud outside while we're practicing on the inside. And when the doors were open, they would come in and run around like a bunch of banshees and just being nutty and crazy. And they were like the Holy Spirit was just moving in them. And it was just it was just one of those amazing things. And then when we would uh, have service, all of a sudden spontaneous prayer would break out. We would see teenagers in groups right over here and praying and over here and praying and just praying while we're worshiping and singing. And so I would not bring a message that night. We would just let the Holy Spirit do His thing and we would just let Him pray and just get after it. I mean, we're watching kids surrender things. Like, we're watching them turn... No, this is crazy. But they're turning over their pipes and their drugs and their and their uh, razor blades. And they're just putting it into the middle of this this floor. And we're just watching this and we're we're stunned. And I, I have police officers who are who are my leaders and they're they're watching this drug, these drugs just show up, right? And I'm looking at them like, please don't arrest my kids, right? 
but they weren't worried about it because they were crying and they would take these rides and we would flush them down the toilet and there, there's cigarettes there and the, there's condoms in there and I mean it's just like the Holy Spirit was moving it was a pile of stuff and this would have not happened just one time it was happening on an occasional occasional thing and then the next thing you know we're watching our kids from an un, unconscious state become into a conscious state of Jesus of the Holy Spirit and when they would show up on Tuesdays we would take them out into the community and do community service and we'd just show up and say hey we're going to go bless the community today and we would send kids out just out into the community picking up trash just meeting the neighbors around us and it was just impactful and powerful we showed up at the skate park and we're, we're uh, witnessing to, to skaters and, and they're just to see teenagers witnessing to, to teenagers and it was just amazing and we had a kid who was dressed, you remember like goth, you know what goth looks like, you know, like they were dressed all black and black makeup and black hair and the chains and all that stuff, you know, and the piercings, you know what I'm talking, are you with, you know what I'm talking about, right, we had that kid in our youth ministry, we had a cowboy, I mean, cowboy, that kid was a farmer dude, okay, and so we were worshiping in the sanctuary and this goth kid and this cowboy kid are linked arm in arm, swaying back and forth, praising Jesus. Jesus, come on, right, it was just, a, it was amazing, you can feel the Holy Spirit moving in these kids, and let me tell you, when I stepped down from you being a youth pastor to become the senior pastor of that church, we had 80 kids running in our, in our, children, our children, our youth ministry, we went from 10 to 12 to 80, and they were on fire. They were on fire. This youth group was the revival that broke out in that church and in their community. This was their return to consciousness. Amen? Amen. Ooh, how many of you want to be involved in something like that? Right? I had nothing to do with it. The Holy Spirit was doing it, man. It was amazing. Right? To see these kids come to the altar and lay it all down. They had some junk, y'all. They had some junk in their life. And they were getting rid of it. It was powerful. But Ezekiel, <laughs> Ezekiel, God had this hold on Ezekiel. I don't believe it was a headlock. I don't believe that. I believe he grabbed his hand and he said, come on. And he took him to this place. This grip was something that he couldn't get a hold of. And I want you to know, I want God to get a hold of me like that. You with me? I want God to grab me. And he took him to this place, to this valley, where all these dry bones are. Can you picture it? Can you see it? I was imagining it as I was reading it to you. Can you see it? It's piles and piles of bones, dry bones on top of each other. There was death there, and death has been there for quite a long time. There was not even uh, anything that you could pick off the bones except for dust. It was there. It was dusty. And God asked uh Ezekiel, this question, he says, do you believe that these bones can live again? Is that a trick question? If God is asking you, do you believe these bones can live again? Well, you got a hold of my hand. I believe all things are possible with you, right? And so he says, you know, basically you know, Ezekiel's like, um, yeah, you, you're the only one that can answer that question. And God, God says, actually, I can answer that question, right? Right? And so here he is. Can you picture what uh, Ezekiel seen? Just miles and miles of bones. These are dead people. These are folks who once lived. These were folks who once breathed. These are folks who once uh, had relationships with each other. These are folks who talked to each other. And he's walking through them. God is navigating him through this. Dry bones. <laughs> and then he says... I want you to prophesy. I want you to tell them. Uh, I want you to speak over them. That these bones are going to live again. And they're going to come back again. And so Ezekiel's like, okay. And then all of a sudden, these rattling things start happening. Right? The bones who are still dusty, they start moving. Can you picture this? Come on, picture this. Right? And they're rattling. Bones are rattling. It's, I mean, you're, you're hearing it. 
right? And he, I wonder if Ezekiel's like, he's around these bones and they're moving in between his legs. And that's kind of a weird feeling, you know what I'm saying? Some are bumping into him and this and the other. And he's like, he's watching them all form skeletons, right? And then he's starting to see the muscles and the tendons and the, and the, and the veins and everything coming and coming together. And then he's watching flesh go over and then he's watching skin go over. Come on, man, that's trippy. Tell me you wouldn't be freaked out if you were in the middle of that. If you say, I wouldn't be freaked out, you're a liar. Lord, forgive the liars. Because I'd be like, this is, this is walking dead in reverse, man. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. Right? And so the dry bones that were touching you, now you've got skin and it's warm. And you're, you're, not, you're not moving, you're not kicking bones. These are people. But they're still dead. They're still in a state of unconsciousness. Can I tell you something? You can still be walking around and living everyday life and still be in a state of unconsciousness. Amen. But, God said, I want you to prophesy and that I'm going to breathe breath into them. <laughs> and instantly, this wind, these winds came out. And it was God's breath that went into these bodies. I want you to picture this now. All the bodies are laying down. Dead. I believe their eyes were open. Eyes open, no life, trippy kind of stuff. Those of you who lived in the 60s, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> trippy kind of stuff. <laughs> Some of you are laughing you're like, yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> right? So, right? And so, um, <laughs> I'm not a 60s kid. So, I, shame on you guys. So, anyways, right? So, there's this trippy kind of stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about. Come on. And God says, I'm, I'm going to breathe breath into them. His ego is like, okay. So, he prophesies over them, right? Just like Avery in my truck. These winds came in, <gasps> taking a deep breath, getting air back into their new lungs, right? And guess what? They stand up. And what does he see? It says here, it says if you have like uh, the King James or the NIV, it says a vast army, V-A-S-T, a vast army is standing before him. This means that this is an immeasurable army of people. Can I tell you something? God-sized things start happening when God breathes life into those things. Amen. You didn't hear me. God-sized things start happening when God breathes life into those things. God-sized things are going to happen in your life when He breathes into your things. Into your struggles, into your worries, into your anxieties, into your, your cares, into your addictions, into your relationship. When God breathes into it, you must inhale it. The breath of God is powerful. Check this out. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Adam was created, but didn't become a living person until God breathed it into him. How many of you need God to breathe into you? Amen. I do. Check this out. Acts chapter 17, right? Yep, 17. So, he is God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man, uh, doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. He is the giver of life, and he is the satisfier of every need. That is who God is. Two weeks ago we spoke about revival in us. I told you that I believe that we will not see revival break out into our country, into our world, until it breaks out in you. You've got to have revival break out in you to live again. And how important is it 
for us to connect to God on a personal level for that revival to break out in us. And listen, I believe it's time now. Say now. now. I believe it's time now that the church returns to consciousness. I'm doing my own personal study in Revelation. You should probably go check out Revelation. I'm in chapter 3 of Revelation. And God is talking about this church in Sardis. And he says this. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to jasify it. Okay. This is what it says. He says basically to this church. He says, you church are dead. You're a dead church. I was just talking to some of my uh, leaders just out here before you all showed up today. And I was sharing about what, what God was saying. I said, what would you do if God came up to you and said, hey, the church you go to is dead. What a sock in this gut. He says, I need you to wake up. You need to wake up. But if you choose to continue to go down this path and continue to be dead, then I'm going to take those of you who are awake and we're going to go do some amazing things. Again, I'm Jason of it, okay? Go read it. Chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. Man, he talks about Church of Sardis. Can I, I wonder, can I ask you this? And I'm just going to be personal and you don't have to raise your hand. You do anything. But can I ask you this? Are you dead? All right, what, if, what if God came up to you and said, Jason, you are dead. I need you to wake up because you are useless as a dead person, but you are powerful as a one who is awake and alive. I wonder how many of us are walking through life right now like the walking dead. No care, no worries, just focus right here. I wonder if you were to wake up and come into a, a state of consciousness right now and start just spreading the love of Jesus like we should and wake up, I wonder how more powerful you would become. Are you dead? Are you in a state of unconsciousness? Are you asleep? Ephesians 5.14 For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper! Rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. You are a flashlight to the world. Come on, the world is dark. You're a flashlight. I don't want to be a flashlight. I want to be a lighthouse. They have bigger bulbs. That's what I want to be. Can you imagine my head just... I just want to see what Shelly's going to do. Right? So, she did great. She did great. That's, that's what we need to be, right? But we cannot be a light to the world if we're asleep. You with me, church? Amen. Come on, if you're with me, say amen. amen. Right? I must be stepping on some toes today. That's all right. I love stepping on toes. Right, so it's time to wake up, church, and start. To, it's time to start shining uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' light bright. When I was a youth pastor, I believed that if I had ten teenagers, ten teenagers who, who truly loved Jesus and truly got it and understood it, I believed that we would be able to change their schools. I had visions. I had visions that. Uh, we would see in the high schools and uh, just all schools. I had visions where, like during passing hour, the kids would be in the middle just praying, and they're late to class because prayer revivals were breaking out in their schools. I believe that. I believe it. And there were kids who were doing it who would just show up one or two, and they would just pray. And I would tell them, "Don't be late for class, but get in there and pray." It was powerful. Listen, prayer got back into school. <laughs> right? I challenged all my kids, these, these teenagers, to take their Bibles to school. Take your Bibles to school. And these kids have, like, you know, the cell phones, so I make them take selfies with their Bible. I want proof, right? So take a picture of me, like, yeah, do that. Psh, yeah, all right. Well, here's, here's, psh, 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 psh. I was like, great. <laughs> now send me one with you in the Bible, not just you, okay? And so they sing it, right? So it's cool. So, and I would put it up on the screen uh, at, the, at the church I was at. And I put it up on the screen so everybody could see. It's like, check this out, man. These are the kids. 
<laughs> and then all of a sudden, I was starting to get adults taking pictures of them taking their Bibles to work, right? But can I tell you something? The kids were leading the adults. I don't care. I loved it. I loved it, right? I believe it would change the school. Listen to this. I believe if we have a church of people who truly love Jesus and got it, we can change the community. Amen. I believe that. That's why living water's here. That's why living water exists. Check this out. This is what uh, uh, this is our mission statement. Living water exists to impact our community through the movement of Jesus Christ, transforming our city through His living water. We are a church that is already impacted our community. We're already impacting your I'm going to brag about you for a little bit because I love you. I love what you do. I love who you are. I love how you're impacting the community. I love how you're changing the community. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. I love that. We are impacting our community with the movement of Jesus. Can you? Do you believe that the movement of Jesus needs to happen right now? Right? I do too. I believe there has to be a movement right now. And this movement has to be of Jesus. And I got to tell you, Jesus is spoken here and he is shared out there. Amen? We are so blessed to be a part of this church that is joining Jesus where he is and changing our community. Can I tell you, because of you, because of this you truly loving Christ and because you truly are getting it and you want to change the impact. Can I tell you something? We now have homeless teenagers who are not homeless anymore. Come on. That's because of you. Right? You, you spent time yesterday blessing a single father of three to build a home that he's never had before. His wife left him. She's been dealing with a lot of addictions and stuff. And he says, I can't have that. So he walked away and got divorced. And now he's got Jesus. You're investing in guys like Jamie. Come on. Are you with me? Christmas Eve. We don't have Christmas Eve service. We're serving our community by bringing Christmas and, and, and joy into people who can't receive that. You are doing that. You're showing up at, 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 uh, at needs and you're, you're making Thanksgiving baskets and you're filling up their pantries. You're doing that. You are doing that. If I had a church of people who truly love Jesus and got it, we can change the community. We're not a dead church. We just don't talk about it. We live it. We are awake. Amen. Living water, you're awake. And if you're not awake, and if you're sitting in here right now and you're not awake, wake up! Wake up! You are not defined by what the world and Satan says you are. You are defined by the great, mighty King, the God who sits on the throne, who is in control, who calls earth His footstool. You are loved by Him. You are a son and daughter of Christ. You are a child of the Most High King. That's who you are. You are defined that way. You are not defined by your anxieties. You are not defined by your depressions. You are not defined by whatever is defining you. You are defined by God. Put your eyes on Him. Stop paying attention to the things around you. And the things around you, change it. Change it. Because you are now in a state of consciousness. You are alert. You are awake. You are the light of the world. So go be it. And you don't have to go to USI and you don't have to show up at the depot on Christmas Eve and you don't have to show up at Jamie's house and you don't have to show up at Needs or Camilla House or at Life Choice. You don't have to show up there. You have to show up where you are. Bring your house to consciousness. Bring your neighborhood to consciousness. Bring your community to consciousness. Only you can do that. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. Ooh. Live, 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 live. Dry bones, do something with the Lord. Right? <laughs> I just lost it. Oh man, praise him. Come on, let's, let's sing that song. Come on, praise him. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right? It's time for us to return to consciousness. I'm going to ask you this question, okay? I'm going to ask you this question. 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine what our world will look like right now during this pandemic if the body of Christ would return to consciousness? Can you imagine it? We have been, we've been talking a lot. It's time to start doing a lot. Let's bow our heads, close your eyes, everybody just close your eyes. I want to I talk to some of you right here, right now, who are battling some things. I don't know what those things are, but when I said battling some things, you knew exactly what it was. It's bringing death into your life. Something that has a tight hold on you. Something that has a, a tight grip on you. The eternal had a hold on me, and I couldn't escape it. Whatever is holding you right now that is not of God, do me a favor. The thing that holds on to you, you're holding on to it too. So I'm just asking you to release your grip. And in your other hand, I want you to grip, grab onto the hold of God. Because He's got a hold of you. And I'm wondering if maybe you're thinking, Pastor, I, I'm, I've got some dry bones in me. I got some things that are that are heavy, that are addictive, and I can't seem to let go. I want you to know that our God is a chain breaker. <laughs> a good friend of mine. He says, Jason, I was reading in Proverbs. And he starts quoting it. It happens to be one of my favorite verses. So it's out of Proverbs 28. All right, so it says this. It says, the wicked run even when no one is chasing them. <laughs> That's chaotic. But the righteous, the right living you, stand their ground as bold as lions. I'm actually looking out into this congregation and I see a pride alliance. That thing that seems to have a hold of you, can I tell you something? You let go of it, it's going to run away. Did you know that there is power in just the name of Jesus? If you say Jesus' name, Jesus! Did you know it makes the demons tremble? The Bible says shudder. That means to tremble violently. <laughs> That's the name. And you are a child of God. You have Jesus living inside of you. How much more powerful are you? In the name of Jesus, anxiety, get away from me. In the name of Jesus, depression, be gone from me. In the name of Jesus, suicide, get away from me. In the name of Jesus, my marriage that is broken, be healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, addictions, get away from me. In Jesus' name, poverty, get away from me. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I cast you out in Jesus' name. I wonder how many here right now just need to say Jesus' name out loud. If you need to say it now, Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You are living in freedom. Jesus. I want, to, I want to ask this question too. Oh, I know I was going to pray, but man, Holy Spirit, thank you for taking my tongue and running with this. But 
here's the deal. I asked this question. How many of you want a relationship with Jesus Christ? And I said, a real relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that question now. Nobody's looking around. I'm going to ask that question right now. How many of you are saying, Jason, I need a real relationship with Jesus Christ? If that's you, raise your hand and say, I need, I want, I need to experience a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, just raise your hand. I, I need you, Lord. I want you, Lord Jesus. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Keep your hands up. Father, I pray for every hand that is up and every hand that is not. I pray, Lord, that we would walk into a real relationship with you right now, Father. I pray that you would just speak loudly, God, into our lives, God. I pray, Lord, that there may be things uh, that are in us right now. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Receive this. Lord, I'm praying, God, that you would just remove the things that have a tight grip on us. Maybe impure thoughts, impure heart, God. I pray, Lord, that you remove that in Jesus' name. Father, I pray, God, that we would walk closer to you, God, every day. God, that when you speak, we feel your breath on us, God, and we can smell the kind of gum you're chewing. God, you say that if we walk close to you, you're going to come close to us. So, Father, we pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would set us free, that you put us into this freedom, God, that we need to be in. And, Father, I pray, God, that we would just have this relationship. Oh, Lord, this relationship. God, take a hold of our hearts, take a hold of our life, physically and spiritually, Lord. Transform us right now, Holy Spirit. Father, we believe, we believe, Jesus, we believe that you died on the cross for us. You went. You went. You willingly put yourself on the cross for me. You did that so that you could have a tighter grip on me. they will be saved and speak with their mouth that Jesus is Lord Father we want a real relationship with you so Father I pray that you remove everything God chains that are that are holding us down snap them disintegrate them Turn them into dust. Let them fly like chaff does. Get away from us. Thank you. Father, and I pray that if there's anyone here right now who will say, Lord Jesus, for the very first time, come and be my Savior. Come and be my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Messiah, my great I Am. Thank you for rattling my bones. Thank you for bringing them back together. Thank you for reminding me of who I am in you. Thank you for breathing your breath of life in me. Thank you, God, for standing me up to become a, uh, an immeasurable and an uncounted army of you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your freedom. Thank you for setting us free. Whew. Jesus, you look good on us. And you smell good on us, too. Thank you for your freedom. Thank you, God, for, for everything. And may we live our life, God, the way we're supposed to. Shining for you 
No longer allowing things to dictate what we do, but allowing you, God, to dictate what we do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, say it in Jesus' name. Say it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say it in Jesus! In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I want you to know something. Right now, you are experiencing freedom that you've never experienced before. Can I tell you something? The chains are gone. Okay, you are now in a relationship, a real relationship with Jesus. That if you gave your life to Jesus for the very first time, I want to know about it. But this heaven already knows. They're already celebrating you. There's already a party going on for you. They're already claiming more land in heaven because it's expanding because of you. Because of you, your house is going to change. Because of you, your family's going to change. Because of you, your community's going to change. Because of you, your workplace is going to change. Because of you, because of you, it's all about Jesus. Yes. So stand up. Come on. Stand up. We're going to sing this song. And I want you to belt it better than you were belting, man. And you were rocking it. We were singing it here. But I want you to sing it in a, in a place. I want you to sing it as if you were that army that just woke up. Where Ezekiel was experiencing it and feeling it, right? I want you to sing like you were there. But I also want you to sing like you've experienced freedom here, all here. You are a new creation. Listen to me. You are a new creation. Veteran Christian, you're a new creation now. You got that new car smell. Come on. You with me? I'm telling you, Jesus looks good on you right now. From the same time, who sits on the throne, who is alive, and is breathing life right now into people that we don't know. Ready to receive it? Ready to receive it, church? Come on. Let's get into a state of consciousness. You're awake now. You're not asleep. You're not dead anymore. 